There's a quote that I've heard you say, which is, it's much easier to get things done if you don't worry about who gets credit. Can you actually act in the public sector by that quote? If you want to get done anything, especially in government, you must share credit. In government, I learn, first of all, policy is key. To really have big impact and big solutions, you need good policy. But sharing credit and give everyone credit and you get a lot of things done. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome to another Walker Webcast. It's my real pleasure uh, to have my friend and um, I would partner Priscilla Almodovar, the CEO of Fannie Mae, joining us today. Uh, before I dive into an intro on Priscilla and uh, just a couple quick things at the top of the um broadcast this week. First of all, we're just about to have our 200th Walker webcast, which is, um, it's hard to believe that we've done 200 of these. And I'm deeply thankful to Susan and the rest of the Walker webcast team for all the hard work that's gone into making this uh, both have legs and also be able to attract the incredible guests such as Priscilla that we've been able to get on a weekly basis. Uh, my guest for the 200th is going to be General David Petraeus, um, and uh, I'm super, super, super excited to have General Petraeus join me next week to talk about the world we live in from his perspective uh, as a uh, uh, former general um, and uh, now sitting at KKR, working with KKR on their global security strategies for all the different investments that KKR makes around the globe. Uh, but we will talk, as you can imagine, uh, about Europe, about the Middle East, about China, uh, and about U.S. foreign policy and military policy uh, as we uh, approach the presidential elections. Um, the second thing that I just had to point out, because it's just um, Priscilla is an adamant athlete and spends a lot of time running. Many of the people who listen to the webcast know that I do a lot of biking. Um, the death of the two brothers last week in New Jersey on Friday, uh, Thursday night, uh, there for their sister's wedding on Friday um, is just so heartbreaking. And uh, more than losing two outstanding young men, um, one of the brothers having won the Hobie Baker Award and been an NHL all-star for years and years and being at their sister's uh, there for her wedding. Um, but more importantly, just the the fact that they couldn't go out and ride their bikes on the road and getting hit by a drunk driver and losing both of their lives. Um, quite honestly, all of my biking community friends, um, we were all texting about just what a sad, sad event and just how sad it is that our roads aren't safe enough for people to go out and get the type of exercise that those two incredible athletes were getting uh, last Thursday evening. And obviously our thoughts and prayers go out to their family for their tragic loss. Um, and then finally, um, I would say that a lot of people tune in to sort of hear my perspective on what's going on in the markets. And I try and always keep the, 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 the light on my guest. And today's guest will give us great insight, I think, into what's going on in the economy and what we should expect as it relates to sort of Fed policy and, and mortgage rates and things of that nature going on. I know Priscilla will try and demure on a lot of that, saying that she's got economists who do all that for her, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push her on that one a little bit. Um, but I would just say that it's very evident that with rate cuts on the horizon, um, investors in commercial real estate and more specifically in multifamily um, are quite active again. Um, we are seeing a, 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 a huge uptick um, in activity kind of across the sales and financing um, side of our business. Um, and it's uh, it's a after the great tightening, uh, nice to see a little bit of a thaw coming. Um, and I think the other piece to it is that with rates having been quite stable uh, in this sort of three seventy five to four fifty range. Um, having an ability to put a cost of capital uh, on deals that is allowed for actual bidder lists to grow, people to actually get some type of conviction that they're buying at a real cap rate with real financing costs that they can underwrite. Uh, and that's obviously allowing for transaction volumes to start to um, recover um, to where they were, um, not quite pre-great tightening, uh, but certainly quite a change from 2023. Um, so let me do a quick introduction to Priscilla, and then we 
will dive into our discussion. Uh, Priscilla Almodovar is President and Chief Executive Officer of Fannie Mae, uh, a leading provider of mortgage financing in the United States and serves on Fannie Mae's Board of Directors. Priscilla leads Fannie Mae's mission to facilitate equitable and sustainable access to home ownership and quality affordable rental housing across America. Prior to joining Fannie Mae, Priscilla was president and CEO of Enterprise Community Partners, a national organization focused on investing and increasing the supply of affordable housing. Previously, she was a managing director at JP Morgan Chase, where she led two of the firm's national real estate businesses, Earlier in her career, Priscilla was president and CEO of the New York State Housing Finance Agency and the State of New York Mortgage Agency. Priscilla started her career as a partner at the global law firm White & Case, specializing in international project finance. Priscilla is a board member of Realty Income Corporation and also serves on the board of New York Road Runners. She earned a bachelor's degree from Hofstra University and a law degree from Columbia. So Priscilla, you were born in Brooklyn, you went to college and law school in New York. You worked at White and Case in New York for 14 years before then going to work for the state of New York. You then went to the largest bank in New York, and then you went to Enterprise. My question is, how did Fannie Mae get you to come to Washington? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Willie, thank you for having me. Congratulations on your 200th uh, episode. That's a, that's a big number. And thank you for your partnership and your entire team at Walker Dunlap. I mean, you're number one, uh, our number one desk lender. So we really appreciate uh, working with you. Um, so, yes, I'm a true New Yorker, um, but Enterprise got me to go to Maryland. So I, I know the deal. Did, did you move? You didn't move to Baltimore. I, I, well, I was going right? to move, but this thing called the COVID pandemic happened. So, so I did not move. And these days I spend half my time in D.C. I'm, I'm in New York today because of the holiday uh, weekend. Um, but I spent Tuesdays to Thursdays in D.C. And because you're a runner, my running these days is only in D.C. So um, I'm signed up for the October um, Army race at a 10 miler. Um, I did the April cherry blossom. So I feel I'm sort of city. just as an aside, Priscilla, I checked it. You did negative splits on the on the cherry blossom. Yeah, uh, that's miler. Yes, I'm slow. I'm slow, but I'm a smarter runner. Negative splits. You you well, went you well, went you started slower and you got faster yeah, throughout the well, race. That's I, the that, that's was, the idea. I was slow on um, because I have not been running. I'm, I love my job. The one thing that has sacrificed a bit is my running. Um, I was going slowly, but I knew when you run, I had more gas in the tank. So I did at the end pull through. And it was a beautiful day for anyone who did it. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. So getting you to come to D.C., one of the things that I thought was so interesting in listening to some of your previous interviews was that you had a briefcase when you were six years old. So uh, knowing that you went into international project finance and into real estate, when you were that little six-year-old in Brooklyn, New York, what, were, what was the dream that was going to, what was going to be in that briefcase as a six-year-old uh, versus where you've ended up in your career? Gosh, um, I, I don't know what I thought as a six-year-old, but I knew I knew I wanted to be a boss. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've just owned that. Um, and I've always been um, very hardworking, very optimistic, very much of a can-do um, attitude. So um, a relative gave me a literally an attache case um, as a holiday gift, and that became my book bag. And I would proudly take it to school every day. And uh, it's um, someone told me that it sums me up pretty well. Huh. Um, was there anything that was outside of sort of business that you as a as a as a as a young girl aspired to? Did, is there ever a a ballerina thought or a a uh, um a school teacher thought or something else that or was it always I'm gonna go do business? And if so, why'd you do law school rather than going yeah. to business school? Yeah, no, that that's a great question. So I wish I can I wish I had some good answer than to say. I just I just like to learn and uh didn't have much of a plan. Um I um I went to college, I went to Hofstra at 16 years old. Um, I was clearly I was a um 
a big fish in a small pond and I'm very grateful to the place. And time came, I graduated, I was 19, I was 19, I'm now a junior. And I had this tremendous uh, guidance counselor. And she said to me, I was an economics major. She's like, you can get a PhD in economics. You can go to business school or you can go to law school. And um, I didn't know what I wanted to do at that point. Um, but she did say that law school was probably the most flexible um, of all of them. So I went to law school. And when you get out of law school, you go to work for White and Case and you became a partner at White and Case um, and one of the few female partners at White and Case. Was that an opportunity or a burden? An opportunity. You know, honestly, um, I grew up in White and Case, I like to say. Um, I was I was very young as an associate. I did become a partner. I was I think at the time I might have been the third woman partner at the time. Um I just, you know, again, uh, I've been very fortunate to have been surrounded by leaders who've seen my potential, have given me opportunities. And, uh, you know, uh, that's when I learned that probably I would have gone to business school if I'd known then, uh, because I was a corporate lawyer. And it's it's quite common uh, for corporate lawyers who do deal work. By the way, um, like you, I could have been Latin America. My first like 10 years in my career was almost all, this was in the 1990s, um, doing all the privatizations of banks and airports and toll roads. Um, so I could have gone that route, but life t- takes turns. And um, 20 years ago, I discovered housing. And you went through my bio, it's Fannie Mae's my fifth role in this incredible uh, industry that we're part of. Before we jump to that, as it relates to White and Case days, I, I'm certain that you and I were sitting on some I'm airplane sure. <laughs> between New York and Argentina when I was doing deals for Morgan Stanley and Latin America. I know what, I yes, I, 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 I am I, sure. It's one of those things where I thought back on it. I was like, there's no doubt that we were like sitting across the aisle from each other and had absolutely no idea that 30 years later, we'd be doing something like this together. But it's it's kind of wild. I had the same thought, Willie, when I yeah. learned about you. No, no doubt. Um, so... I've heard you say that leaving White and Case was the riskiest thing you've ever done. Yeah. Why why take the risk or what was it about jumping into state government that had you leave, quite honestly, the very established, mm-hmm. lucrative, mm-hmm. secure world of White and Case and kind of jump into local state politics? Yeah. So it was the biggest decision I've ever made professionally. Um, Not only did I love my practice, my clients, my partners were fantastic. I mean, I I literally grew up there, as I said. Um, And I think what happened, you know, life is long. Um, At that point, I had two children with my husband, who also has a 24-7 kind of job. And um, I took a leave of absence. Um, it's the leave of absence uh, was two months. It turned out to be two years. And during that time, I guess I'm not someone who sits still. Um, I started uh, working on a campaign. Uh, uh, actually, it wasn't a campaign officially yet. I started working on policy work. I didn't know anything about policy. Um, and it literally changed the trajectory of my life. And that's when I discovered housing. And I mean, so you discover housing, but come on, it's like there's got to be something more there to say. I'm I'm jumping out of the the ivory tower literally to go and like roll up my sleeves. I mean, I know that first of all, uh, you you know when you were growing up in Brooklyn, at first your your family was renters, and then you became yeah. owners when you were like five years old. So you you yeah. clearly saw the, the the progression, and and all of us have some sense of where we're from and the and the actual structure or building that we lived in and what those formative years were but what was it about housing policy housing finance that got you so engaged in the what was that 2007 2008 2004 2004 five yeah i'm pretty old actually easy on that one you and i are exactly the same age so anything you say is it relates to that i I know yeah. exactly where I was when I was six because you and I were six at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, but talk that, about that. What was it that got you so so engaged in it? Yeah, no, I I think I think you sort of have touched on it. So first of all, I love finance. Number one, number two, project finance, and then I discovered housing, which 
also was all about people and um, I love people. So I found this industry where I could have a huge impact on people and the mission. I think back to that six-year-old girl who um, had that attache case. You know, I grew up as a renter. Um, I grew in a very loving home. My parents came from Puerto Rico in the 1950s. And um, I remember they were savers. They bought their first home when I was five years old. And that home, I mean, this is the work we do. It's about people who saved, were renters, and bought a home. And that home paid for my education, paid for my law school, paid for my siblings' education. So I, I found an area in finance that um, I could do it all and potentially have an impact. I think if I think of my parents, they were always very, um, uh, my mom's a very religious person. And I think giving back. So I found something where I can give back and still do complex, interesting work. And um, as I said, I, this is my fifth role. I've been in three sectors, all doing housing. I've been in the public sector when three years when I ran the New York State Housing Agency, then J.P. Morgan. I ran two businesses there. So I saw it from the private side and probably one of the best bank, well-run banks in the world. Um, then Enterprise. I, I thought I would retire from Enterprise. I was a former board member of Enterprise. And um, then I got a call from a headhunter. And I got to Fannie Mae. So uh, I've been fortunate with each role to stay in housing. And each one just gave me a bigger platform to hopefully have a bigger impact. And holy cow, Fannie Mae is the culmination of all of it, because I think it's one of the rare jobs. I don't know if you can think of many that touches all of housing from rentership to home ownership. And that's my story. I get the full continuum. And by the way, all the stakeholders, like, holy cow, how many stakeholders there are that Fannie Mae has to manage. So it's, uh, I view this, this position as a culmination of my 35 plus years, because what I even learned at Wine Capes, I, I draw on that experience as well. Um, so it's all coming together in this pretty incredible role. And um, hopefully it could have an impact in the country. I'm not so sure that this is the final stop. I, I, I was thinking about your career and Sean Donovan's career. And Sean was, ran the New York Housing Authority. Then he went yeah. to uh, then he went to run HUD, then OMB, then Enterprise. And so I'm thinking, yeah. I think you might have to go from Fannie to OMB and run OMB oh. for a period of time, Priscilla, to kind of you know, so you and Sean can stay on those yeah. on those parallel paths. You know, uh, Sean is one of my proudest. The other thing I will share with you, what's amazing about housing. Sean was one of the people I met back in probably 2006. And I, we're still very good friends. I mean, one of my uh, proudest relationships from state service was my relationship with Sean. So, I mean, I still go back 20 years. I have the same relationship. That's what's so great about what we do. I'm sure it's true of you. I mean, I've been working with people and every, again, this is my fifth position and I'm still drawing on there were many on the multifamily side, but you know, the three years I was in single family in New York State had those relationships as well. So before we jump from New York State to um JP Morgan for a moment, um I've there's a quote that you uh that I've heard you say, which is it's much easier to get things done if you don't worry about who gets credit, uh, which is a great quote, except it's sort of the antithesis of what I found when I ran the DC Water Authority and dealt with politicians from D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and all around where it seemed like the only thing that people were care cared about was who got credit for something. So for a moment, given that you've been in the private sector as well as in the public sector, um, do you think that you can, can you actually act in the public sector by that quote of it's easier to get things done if you don't worry about who gets credit for it? I learned that in the public sector. Really? Yes. That um, certainly isn't what I've seen no, in the public so sector. What? It seems like all they care about is who gets credit. No, well, so if I may, so one, I learned many things in, in the public sector, but I will, I was very new. I didn't know anything about government. I mean, I was at one case all those years. I get, you know, run New York State Housing Agency. And there was this um, major deal that we were going to do. And we were going to bring the governor to go to the grant, the ribbon cutting. And we didn't call anyone. We just went to the ribbon cutting. I get back to the office and the state assemblyman called me and said, what do you mean? You're, and yeah, we had a personnel and said, you, you're supposed to call the state assemblyman, the senator, the mayor. And naive me said, why would I do that? They had nothing to do with it. 
And did I get schooled? Mm. And he said to me, until this day, he's past, he's deceased now, till this day, I have learned if you want to get done anything, especially in government, you must share credit because we actually, Sean Donovan and I would talk about this. He had a very strong principle. I had a very strong principle. And we're like, wait a second, they have different, different constituencies. The two of us could do things. Everybody gets credit. So I learned that lesson in government. Now, what's that expression? Success has a lot of fathers, right? You know, yep. whatever. So, um, but yes, up to the contrary, I have learned in government. I learned first of all, policy is key to really have big impact and big solutions. You need good policy, but sharing credit and give everyone credit, and you get a lot of things done. Super interesting. It's super interesting. I, I, the, the, when we were when I was running DC Water, we we built this digester, which was a $400 million um, biosolid uh, treatment plant where we take the, the the biosolids from the treatment and we'd burn them and turn it into electricity. And then that would, that now generates all the electricity for Blue Plains, which is the um, wastewater treatment plant in Washington, DC, the largest in the world. And um, when we actually made the decision at the board to fund it was 2009. And fast forward to 2016, I think it was when they actually had done all the studies, built the darn thing, and it was up and going and made Blue Plains self-sufficient as it relates to energy. And I looked at the front page of the Washington Post, and there's this great ribbon cutting ceremony. And there's that the mayor of DC at that time, not Adrian Fenty, who was there as the mayor who actually got me to do that. The new chairman of the board, not me, the new credit, you know, the new head of DC Water, not George Hawkins, who actually did it. And I'm sitting there looking at all these people taking credit for it. And I said, that's the only way you get really big stuff done is if people are happy to get it done and not be there for taking credit for it. So I think it's it's a very similar type thing. I think your point as it relates to sharing credit is a very important one. But at the same time, I also saw a lot of people say that if I'm not going to be on the front page of the Washington Post, it's not worth my vote. It's not worth my time. So sorry for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um the the one other piece to working for New York State, mission, purpose, and people. Um what was what what was unique about the mission, purpose, and people at the state level versus you know what you'd done previously in the private sector? Yeah. So um what I learned also first of all I was in the state during the great financial crisis. So um, I learned what I learned there. I learned a lot about you could motivate people, first of all, with purpose, right? When you're in the public sector, your client is the public. And we had an incredible uh, mandate. But but when I joined, the agency was not really living up to its full mandate. And um, at the risk of sounding totally immodest, one of my proudest moments is what New York State Housing Finance Agency is today. And I think I set the groundwork to say, first of all, let's lean into our mandate, which is affordable housing. We were doing 80-20s at the time, which is nothing wrong with that. We had to do those deals to be able to do the affordable, but we started doing affordable and we made money doing affordable and we would reinvest them in new affordable deals. And it was during the crisis where the agency leaned in. That's when I first met Fannie Mae, um, was in the GFC. I think the state saw the struggling homeowners in New York State. I mean, New York State is just, you know, you have Buffalo and there's a lot of home ownership and struggles there. And um, saw that mission really is a rallying cry to bring a workforce together. Um, there's this, uh, there was this one very senior leader at the agency um, who told me one day, I told my wife, I've never worked so hard in my life but I'm having so much fun under you. So it says, that's another lesson I've learned from government that with the right leadership, the right um, purpose, and that's true in the private sector too. And frankly, true in Fannie Mae. I mean, I am amazed at the commitment of our 8,300 employees. I mean, we come to work every day to do the best we can to serve the housing needs of the United States. And we do it with great integrity. Um, and I think that that's why our engagement scores are so high as well, because we see it's very tangible. That's another thing I love about our work. It's very tangible, right? It's about people, but you could actually go and feel um, the projects, the homes that we finance, and it makes it very real for people. So purpose and mission and profit to me, this is the same case in enterprise. An enterprise we're that we were that rare social enterprise that made money to do good. And there's nothing wrong with that. If anything, I have learned through all these roles that 
real innovation happens at the intersection of mission and profit. And um, you try to do the best you can to, to try to maximize the two. So um, another person that you and I happen to both know quite well is Jamie Dimon. You got the opportunity to work with Jamie for a number of years. Yes. What what did you learn from Jamie while you were at JPM from either a leadership or a credit management standpoint? Wow. So um, an amazing leader. So what I learned a lot from him. Uh, first, I've learned from him. He treats everyone the same. So what you see is that is who he is. Um, so that's something I, I really valued in him. Uh, Jamie's the one who hired me. And um, it was amazing how he just I still remember our interview. He said things that only Jamie Diamond could say. He's like, okay. So he asked me all these like questions. And he's like, okay, works hard, grew up in Brooklyn, renter. Like he just went, you know, Columbia Ivy League partner. Like he just calculated all this in his head so he could see talent. He stretches people. Uh, but what I really, really have learned from him is um, risk management. I didn't know that if, if you run any business for Jamie Diamond, you do not realize he's making you into a risk manager. And it's end to end, it's all stripes of risk. He, the place, is naturally paranoid. Like it is, it, you know, when you're at the top, you have to be paranoid. And he constantly reminded us that you could always be better, more efficient, better, and always do the right thing. So um, he'd always say this quote, um, he would call people and say, would you sell this product to your mother? And he genuinely mean it. So I, I just, I just think, um, he's just an incredible leader. Um, it's amazing what he's done with JP Morgan. And by the way, Amazing leaders there, all under his tutelage. So I learned a lot from him. Lot. I, I will say your point about amazing leaders. One of the things that I've consistently been super impressed with is the 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 senior leadership team at, at J.P. Morgan is so broad and diverse. I mean, I, look, you and I both engage with lots and lots of financial services institutions that talk about it, you walk into JP Morgan and there is such a diverse senior man. And when I mean senior, the most highest ranks of JP Morgan uh, are, and the backgrounds are so distinct and it's just such a incredible culture as it relates to thinking about ideas and being willing to challenge one another's yeah. ideas. And I just, you know, we do a lot with them. We do a lot with other financial service institutions. I'm not trying to throw anybody else under the yeah. bus, but I think Jamie's focus on getting just the best and the brightest around him, no matter where they come from, what they look like, what their background is, has yeah. just been such a huge benefit to JP Morgan. For sure. And, and for sure. And there's a level of humility. I mean, they know they're good, but they don't, again, as I said, they're paranoid, um, which keeps them really strong. Also, his level of to detail, his attention to detail. So I still remember my first business review with Jamie. So even though my business was a small of the 35 businesses, he's still, he's so disciplined. And once a year, I would have to defend our business in front of him. Holy cow. I mean, he, he like, he would, he reads materials. He asks the tough questions and always one step ahead of you. And it makes you better as a leader. So as I was, I'm as forever the, grateful to him. As a quick aside, I was looking at your earnings from Q2 and saw that you made $4.5 billion, which is a big sum of money. And I was like, I wonder how that kind of just fits into like what JPM made in Q2. So JPM made, I think, $19.6 in Q2. Okay. So, you know, $4.5 is a huge amount, but $20 billion is also a, a somewhat larger one. But then I was trying to figure out what 4.5 billion of earnings for you in Q2 measured up against. And so I just put in a search that said 4.5 billion Q2 earnings. And the one thing that kept coming back was that Meta lost $4.5 billion in Q2 on their investments in the metaverse, in their virtual reality world. And I was sitting there going like, what a luxury to be at Facebook and be able to invest four and a half, lose four and a half billion dollars on the quarter of just investing in the metaverse of whatever Mark Zuckerberg's future vision looks like. Wow. That's yeah. a good number. That's it's good. really quite something. Um, so you go from JPM, this is sort of like when you went from White and Case to the state of New York. You're at JPM, you're doing big deals, you run two of their big real estate businesses, and you leave to go run Enterprise, which by the way, talking about mission, is one of the most mission-driven companies, nonprofits in the country. With that said, you go from all the 
balance sheet and influence that JPM has to a relatively very small enterprise, play on words there. Um, what was that transition like, Priscilla, as it relates to going from the perch you had at JPM to going to a much smaller um, company that didn't have any of the same resources that you had when you were at JPM? Yeah. Um, so I think back to probably mission and purpose. Um, I I loved my time at JP Morgan. I, the first business I ran there was their community development group, um, which was affordable housing, construction, lending, light tech stuff. Um, then I went on the conventional side. And this is not a comment on JP Morgan, um, but um, it, it was the full real estate business. So it no longer was just about project finance and doing deals. It was also about selling treasury products and um, de-risking the balance sheet. So it was not about doing deals. It was because this is, you know, JP Morgan was calling a recession back in like 2015, 2016. So, um, so at some I, point you are actually right. A <laughs> pandemic and a couple other things to cause it, but at some point you're actually right. Right. Um, so again, I learned a lot there um, and I had an amazing team there and it was a national team and very customer focused, but it became harder to service all your clients. So we worked with the cream of the crop developers and, and sponsors, and we wanted their full relationship, not just giving them balance sheet, but we wanted treasury services. We wanted their um, investment banking, et cetera. So um, it was probably 2018. Um I just uh, thought if opportunities came up, I got a call. I wasn't looking for a job, but I was on the board of enterprise, as I mentioned. Um, I got a call from Lon Terwilliger, who's their board chair, and said, we're looking for a CEO. And I gave them names. Um, he called me back 10 months later. I got a call from Shake. I don't know if you know Shake, or folks that you probably know, and called and said, we still haven't found someone. I'm like, well, what are you looking for? And it, all of a sudden, I became the candidate. And, and that's how I ended up at enterprise. I wasn't looking. These, you pulled a Dick Cheney. You pulled the Dick Yes, Cheney. that's what everyone says. Yes. And the, these were, you know, Ron and Jonathan Rose and Shay Carr. We had served on the enterprise board together. So they knew me by, and they just, they knew which, like, which strings to pull. And, uh, and I have to say, it was an unbelievable experience. It was during the pandemic. I learned a lot from enterprise as well, from the workforce as a leader, um, it's uh, it's a very unique organization, um, and it was during, leading any organization during the pandemic uh, was something that was I think every CEO remembers. Why is it so hard to build affordable housing? <laughs> Why is it so hard? Look, it's um, there is an affordability crisis, right? Um, you have uh, rents going up higher than income. Same thing with home prices. You have um, Today, if you look at renters, as you know, a third of renters are paying more than 30% of their income on rents. It all comes down to numbers, right? Um, it builds, you know, you need land, it costs money, you need land, you need the financing, and you have to, the rents, you have to charge the rents. And to keep it affordable for today's households is not easy. So it's a combination of land, it's financing, it's NIMBY is very real when it comes to low-income housing. I saw a lot of that um, at Enterprise. Um, you were seeing it today. So it's just, there's a lot, it needs all stakeholders together to have the courage and the willingness to build more housing. And that's ultimately, I think, what we're seeing now in this country. I mean, supply has been an issue for a long time since the, the GFC, but it's really coming to roost now given um, the affordability. We, we are in an unprecedented time of unaffordability in this country. And given the amount of both capital that Fannie and Freddie supply to the housing industry, the amount of capital that HUD supplies, the amount of capital that Litech supplies. It It seems, Priscilla, like, you know, there's a lot of capital in Washington to kind of, if you will, put to housing and housing affordability, but that the real disconnect is at the local level on land use management and on entitlement. Have how do we how do we solve that disconnect? Uh, and I and I want to give equal airtime to both can presidential candidates now to not seem like we're talking about just one. But I will say that the Harris campaign's proposal on housing to build three million new homes is an actual concrete proposal that, from my personal view, is much better than the 
rent control proposal that the Biden administration had launched previously in the summer. Um, and then on the Trump side, it appears that the housing policy from the Trump campaign is a enforce illegal immigrants and push them back to their home countries, therefore freeing up additional housing, and then also bring interest rates down by being more activist as it relates to Fed policy. That's Those are the two stated policies from housing. I want to focus on the Harris one for a second, though, here, because if the idea is to build 3 million new homes, um, there does seem to be a disconnect connect between the capital that sits in Washington and the policy at the local and state level. Any thoughts on how to sort of kind of marry up those two things to try and actually get to a proposal that the Vice President Harris's campaign is putting forth? Look, I, you know, I'm, I'm not here to opine on any proposal. I will say, I'll confirm, you're right. I mean, there are estimates out there. We have a shortage. And, and our economists say three to four million homes in this country. We're, we're building at a rate that, you know, when you look at net new household formation and what we're building, there's, there's a huge supply demand imbalance. So we need more homes. And you're right. It is a local issue. So um, again, this is where having worked at the state level, um, you really need the integration between federal policy and the local policies because it's real. And, you know, how do you create incentives to align the two? Um, that's the challenge. And I mean, we're trying to do our part um, when it comes to supply, you know, on the single families. We, you know, we we have less tools at Fannie Mae when it comes to supply, per se, um, on the single family side. Um, to the extent we have REO foreclosed properties, we're repairing them to a high standard or selling them to low income and moderate income aspiring homeowners, giving them a 3% uh, discount. Um, we're also on the multifamily side and trying to preserve or create more housing out of existing housing is we're working with sponsors from the conventional space to dedicate some of their units for uh, individuals at 120% of AMI or lower. So we're trying to create, you know, we have to all be very creative that it's, yes, we need new units but we also have to preserve the units that already exist. And it really is all hands on deck. But it's that coordination of um, all levels of go government. It's federal, it's state, and it's local as well. And I mean, in some states, you have county level as well. Um, and um, understanding that everyone has to give something to build this housing, but the numbers have to work as well for developers, right? I mean, developers are not going to build if the deal, as we say in real estate, doesn't pencil out, right? So costs are becoming more expensive. You know, if you think of inflation, the labor costs is more expensive, materials are more expensive. Um, so it's, I think if government were to put subsidies, they have to get something in return. And usually it's some kind of rent restriction. Um, and in the case of single family, uh, you know, Fannie Mae, we're trying to do our part. Uh, we have a 3% down payment um, home mortgage product. And uh, for low income and moderate income, we have down payment assistance and closing cost assistance. So we're trying to do what we can, but it really does take coordination at all levels of government. And Priscilla, given, and I, the, the, I asked this question from a 30,000 foot level to get a sense of how challenging it is for you to run an enterprise that is so integral to this whole, the whole daisy chain of all the influencing parties. And yet at the same time, you're sort of in the penalty box and not allowed to really engage from a political standpoint. And yet at the same time, you're also not allowed to be just a, you know, if you will, a freewheeling public company and and private enterprise how I mean, that's a very sort of i would imagine a very challenging balancing act to to be in the role that you're in particularly i mean you've got four what what is it you have 4.3 trillion dollars of assets something like that billion, yes. i think yeah 4.3 so you're, yeah. you're okay. buying one out of every four home mortgages in america one in four homes and we're about 20 percent of the uh, multifamily of the multi of the multi-market so one out of every five on the multi side and one out of every four on the single family no. side and yet you sort of you, you're you're kind of boxed in because you can't fully engage on the policy side given what's happened with fannie and freddie and conservatorship and you can't just run as a private enterprise that can go do kind of whatever they want to do how, how do you manage that it's got to be wildly challenging 
Yeah, look, challenging makes it fun, right? So uh, we work very closely with our regulator, regulator FHFA. We work very closely with our board. And I would say we're doing an incredible job um, in this situation. You know, we are true to our mission. We provide liquidity, stability, and affordability. We're leveraging technology to let us do what we think needs to be done to make the system more fair and sustainable for everyone. So I would say, yes, there are limitations, but we do the best job we can and work very closely with um, the Federal Housing Finance Agency. We have a tremendous director running FHFA who cares about housing. She's passionate about low and moderate income families. So I would say, you know, again, I've only been to Fannie Mae. It's going to be a little bit, uh, almost two years. And so far, I would say we're highly engaged. Uh, we're reaching out to stakeholders. We're, you know, we like to say at Fannie Mae that we listen, we lead, um, and we do listen to many stakeholders. Look, we set standards. I mean, we don't like to say it so strongly, but we set standards, whether it's for mortgage credit, and multifamily credit. Now, multifamily were only 20% of the market, but in single family, as you say, but one in four, you know, um, I think it's something like 70% of mortgage applications go through our desktop underwriting system that lenders throughout the country use. So I think we have a huge responsibility to ensure that um, access to credit is fair. Um, and I think we're doing a pretty good job. You know, even, even in the slow market, um, I think this year, I think we're like over 187 billion of liquidity combined, you know, single family, multifamily. Um, more and more, we're very leaning in into first time homeowners. So I would say that despite um, the challenging markets in both single family and multifamily, uh, we're serving the market as best as we can. I, I hear you run through those numbers and they're super impressive. Like the, 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 the net worth out of your Q2 financial statement, the net worth of, of, of Fannie has just continued to go up. I think net worth has gone from 47 billion to 60 billion to 77 billion. You added another 9 billion in the first half of 2024. So you're up to $86 billion of net worth. How, how much messaging needs to be done as it relates to the safety and soundness of Fannie and Freddie after 2008 and them going into conservatorship and sort of all of the um, not not only the you know the 190 billion that was required to bail Fannie and Freddie out at the time has been not only okay. returned but then you all have added another hundred billion dollars. It's been the best investment the U.S. federal government's probably ever done. Um, how much how much is that part of your mandate to make sure people understand what's going on from a safety and soundness standpoint, or does you just have to sort of let that take care of itself? Yeah, you know, so it's a great question. And this is where um, I don't know if it's my mandate, but it's my personal mandate. <laughs> so, I don't know if I have the mandate, but I have to say, um, people often ask me what has surprised me the most about Fannie Mae since I've joined, because I've worked with Fannie Mae. This is, as I said, in all my past four jobs, I worked with both Fannie and Freddie. So I knew the enterprises. The number one thing that surprises me the most is even within our industry, that people do not understand how substantially transformed Fannie Mae is. I mean, our business model is completely different, right? So how we made money before the GFC and how we make money today, we it was an investment portfolio. It was a retained portfolio. Today, it's a guarantee. Like we, we, we buy loans, we sell them all. So that's very different. We have different lending standards, right? The product's a 30-year fixed rate mortgage that makes up that 3.6 trillion. Though that's a that's a plain vanilla product as it should be. And that's that's where our book is today. Um, when you look at um, what we've done with capital, when we started retaining earnings in 2019, I'm amazed that people in our industry don't know that we've been retaining earnings, you know, since 2019 and now 87 billion. We have a capital rule now. Now one could argue, yes, are we still undercapitalized for sure? But can we run the business knowing that's the regulatory capital that we have to hit? So it's a completely transform. And by the way, the loss mitigation tools that we have now did not exist. I mentioned I first met uh, Fannie Mae uh, during the great financial crisis. The enterprise didn't know what to do with struggling homeowners. Fast forward during COVID, I worked with Fannie Mae again when I was at Enterprise in two capacities, one for homeowners, but also we had a dust license, right? Do Bellwether Enterprise. Holy cow. I mean, 
talk about transformation. They were able to respond to the pandemic. That story hasn't been told. 1.5 million households kept their homes because of what Fannie Mae did. And by the way, like 99% have been resolved. So the muscle we have, the business model we have, there's a lot for our people to be proud of. And if there's one thing I do while I'm here is to try to close that perception gap. And it doesn't care if we're in conservatorship, out of conservatorship. It is a different business today. It's a well-run business. It's risk managed. It's governed well. We have an incredible board of directors. And I'm going to keep telling that story for as long as I'm in my chair. So talk for a moment then on that same theme as it relates to the benefit that Americans have today of having a long-term fixed rate mortgage. So the numbers that I think you talked about in your earnings call was that 80% of American homeowners have a fixed rate mortgage under 5%. And one of the big differences between the US economy and other economies, developed economies around the globe, is that I mean, if you live in the UK, you've got a typically a five-year floating rate mortgage on your home, and it might be a 10-year mortgage, but it's certainly not a 30-year fixed rate instrument. We're we're incredibly blessed to have the secondary mortgage market in the United States that we have. But it's been one of the big sort of untold stories about why we've come through this sort of great tightening where the consumer still had cash to go out and you know, to go back to the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Jamie Lee Curtis, go out and buy the Kung Fu, the G.I. Joe with the Kung Fu grip, as Eddie Murphy famously says in that movie, but that people could actually go out and spend money. And that, that in other developed economies, I mean, we our GDP growth has been so much greater than that of Japan and the UK and Germany. And one of the main reasons for that is that people, as rates went up, weren't paying more for their home mortgage. It was a fixed expense and not a variable expense. And that's all due to the secondary mortgage market that Fannie and Fannie provide. Yes. So there's a lot there. Um, So even just taking a step back, I think that it's just part of our, as a country, it's part of the American dream, right? 1930, it was part of, um, you know, the New Deal. And uh, that's how generational wealth is still built in this country. And that is just like apple pie, whatever that expression is, right? So that 30 year fixed rate mortgage, and it is very unique to the United States. But another key point you're mentioning, and this is why we at Fannie Mae talk about, we don't yet, I know we all focus on the 10 year for mortgage rates. Um, And because it is a very important component of how the mortgage rate is built. But the other thing is what you're touching upon is the investors. We have a highly sophisticated capital markets when it comes to mortgage finance in this country. So when you think of the fixed income market, you have US treasuries, you have corporate debt, and you have mortgage backed securities. It's incumbent on Fannie Mae, given our business model today, which I mentioned our model today is we buy mortgages, we put them in the TBA market, we sell this. We have to make sure that our investors like the mortgage-backed security, because that is where the liquidity comes from. That is our liquidity. One thing I've learned at Fannie Mae two years is we're so focused on the primary market the liquidity market is key. And therein lies a big question mark because who during the GFC till today, who were the biggest buyers of mortgage-backed securities? It was the Fed and they're not buying anymore. They're just rolling off their portfolio. It was the banks and they've taken a step back as they wait for bank regulatory capital to be resolved. So it's money managers. So we're very lucky that money managers today today, this point in time, are overweight mortgages. But that same money manager has options. They have a choice. They could buy treasuries. They could buy corporate debt. So I think one thing that I've grown to appreciate, which I didn't before I joined Fannie Mae, is how important it is for us to understand, how important for all of us to understand that anything we produce, any new product that we produce, it has to be something that we could sell to an investor because it is key to that liquidity and the stability in the market is to have that mortgage, that investor. And we sold, and when you think of mortgage rates, you know, again, we focus on the 10 year, the 10 years were like at three, eight today or yep. around there, yep. but mortgages now they've come down. So like at six, three, there's about 40% of spread and that spread doesn't get talked about enough. And that spread to the very simple, the most simple way to describe it, there's the investor. They have to get paid for that um, that ability of the consumer to prepay their mortgage. It only exists here, right? So here they think they're buying an MBS. It could be out for 30 years. Instead, it gets refied the minute there's a bond rally. So they got to get paid for that duration risk they take. 
But the other piece is originators. They too have to get paid for originating mortgages. So I think um, us, Fannie Mae, just raising, just putting a highlight more on, on what makes up mortgage rates, because there's so much focus on mortgage rates. They have come down from even a year ago, even from August. Um, I think education and just that transparency is good for the system because we that end to end, the primary all the way to the MBS investor. And, you know, one of the things we do is we bring capital, the U.S., but also foreign capital. Most people don't know that. That oh, yeah. Our mortgage-backed securities, it's a, I think the MBS market, um, it's probably like, I don't know, the, the mortgage market is probably 13 trillion, 14 trillion. Um, yeah. The MBS market is probably 10 trillion. That's coming from U.S. investors as well as foreign investors. And that's part of our job is that liquidity is key, which I did not appreciate until I joined Fannie Mae. So given that 80% of U.S. homeowners have a, a, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage under 5%, the chance that they're going to go and refi that, uh, that's neither here nor there as it relates to when you, where you think rates are going to go. I'm not going to ask you to opine yeah. on that. Yeah. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of trapped equity inside of the U.S. single family um, market. Why not provide secondary mortgages to allow people to add leverage when those fixed rate mortgages are at such a low level? Why wouldn't why wouldn't we do in the single family space what we're able to do in the commercial space? Yeah. So first of all, I'm OK to opine on mortgage rates. Um, okay, that's great. something that our economists oh, do. Come so. right at it. Come yeah, right yeah, at so it. Are I'm they gonna, going down yeah. and what and, and and are they going to and are, is there going to be a, a rotation out of um, uh, uh, money market funds, which I think right now has $6.7 trillion into longer duration as the Fed fund rate comes down and therefore bring down the two-year, five-year, and 10-year? Well, that, that's probably way more sophisticated for me to respond. But um, our economists were more conservative than others out there. So we think, you know, there's probably two rate cuts, one in September, one in December, 25 basis points each. That's where we see the Fed's fund rate. Um, and we have reasons for that, right? The economy is is still growing. It's slowing down, but it's still growing. You know, unemployment still has a forehandle. And if you're in real estate, you know that in construction, you need more, that there's, you need more labor yep. um, and inflation's come down, but it's not at that 2% that, that Chairman Powell has said he so wants. So um, we have taken a more cautious view. As it relates to mortgage rates, uh, we do think that rates will come down, but they'll still be in that six handle this year. You won't probably see them go down south of six, probably to the fourth quarter of 2025. And a lot is what you're describing. It's that lock in effect. So right now we're seeing uh, there, there's this real disconnect between buyers and sellers right now in single family. So the the aspiration to be a homeowner remains very high. It's like our, our last survey, I think something like 92% of non-homeowners aspire to be a homeowner, but yet only one fifth think it's a good time to buy a home. You flip to sellers, they think it's a great time to sell a home because they're seeing these high home prices. So when you couple the lock-in effect, as you said, 80% of consumers today have a mortgage that is at 200 basis points uh, lower than current rates. Uh, you have a lack of inventory. So that's why we think rates, we, you know, we, we don't know that the consumer sees even though the home prices have come down, the pace has come down, the consumer still sees high home prices and the consumer still remembers when mortgage rates were at the 3% just a few years ago. So I think they're going to stay up there six and maybe people transact at six, um, but they're not going to come down real fast. And that's probably what consumers are waiting for. And so um, let's shift for a moment to multifamily. Yeah. Um, the multi-business we've been blessed to be your largest partner for eight of the last 10 yeah, years. Thank you. We have an incredible partnership between our two companies. Um, the originations that both Fannie and Freddie did in 2023 were well below what the regulator has as a, as a cap on originations for Fannie and Freddie. And then this year, Freddie's volumes through the first half of the year are up about 20% off of a very low 23 and Fannie's volumes were down. Why is it that Fannie has um, had a tough time deploying capital in this market on the multifamily side? I think you forgot a very important fact. So in 2023, the market was way down. I think the market was like 246 billion compared to in the 2022, I had like a four or something billion, right? So um, 
Fannie Mae continues to be, we've always been that 20% of existing market. So that was the case in 2023. And this year we're on track as well to be about 20% of the market. So I'm not sure what numbers um, you might be referring to, but um, we look at our pipeline very closely. And um, what we have found is that today, as you know better than me, you now have competition from non-traditional lenders. You know, you have CMBS has come back. And, you know, we we do acknowledge that the market is slower, right? People, because of rates, right? I think until that clarity is there. So all, all of us, we just haven't seen the same level of transactions, but we're quoting deals and we're finding many of the deals we quote go away. They don't happen. But when I look at our numbers, yes, you're, you're right. Our cap is 70 billion. We'll probably be inside, maybe more close to what we were last year, but we're still 20 to 22% of the total market. And I think that's a very important fact. So, Look, you have to look at absolute numbers and the percentage as well, because we have com- competition, right? Um, and and you know, one thing that that um, we talk a lot, a lot of at, at Fannie Mae is we are very committed to the delegated model. And personally, I think it's fantastic that sponsors have different options. If they have our model, they have Freddie's model, which is a very different model. They have CMBS, they have bank capital, they have life codes. That's good. I mean, I'm, again, I'm a former JP Morgan banker. It's good to have different options as a sponsor. But we, I hope where we get to at, at Fannie Mae is, you know, we acknowledge, we should just talk about the elephant in the room, about how things are slowing down, you know. We are very committed to the delegated model, but the world has changed a little bit for us um, this past year. And as when you think about fraud, I don't know about you, Willie, but you know, 18, 24 months ago, we couldn't imagine some of the fraud that we've seen in the industry. So yes, we've had to slow down a little bit. Um, we we are doing more. We are doing more inspections. We do have to get to the root causes. Yes. We're doing more. We're asking our lenders to do more. And frankly, you should be asking your sponsors to do more because they should be worried about tenant fraud. So I think right now our industry is in a point where it's a great industry. We can't have fraud. We all have to get better at detecting it, knowing how to do so to, you know, to bring the activity back. Because there's a lot of tailwinds for multifamily right now. Um, When you look at demographics, um, where you look at, you know, the supply that's coming on, it'll clear through the system. You know, 2026, 2027 might be an amazing year for multifamily. Um, We think um, in terms of valuations that we're probably at the at the end, right? So like our economists say, you know, like a 25% peak to trough, we're probably, I asked them, where are we? How close are we to that 25? And they're like, probably about 20-ish or so. So I think when things settle down, we got to tackle this fraud issue because our ultimate goal is to lean into our delegated model so that folks like Walker Dunlap could provide the certainty that sponsors are looking for. But we're going to need your help. And um, I think it's incumbent on all of us um, to commit to do that. So I think there's a lot of myth about what we're not doing and doing. But when I look at the numbers, we're still delivering about 20% of the capital for multifamily. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to, the, the uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of myth in there. I think that the issue, the, the numbers are the numbers as it relates to caps, non-caps, and where you all are from a competitive standpoint, as far as volumes. I think your comment on on fraud is a very important one. There's been, it's been widely reported. There was a Wall Street Journal article, you know, two weeks ago. I have said numerous times that that Wall Street Journal article should have been read, written a year ago, because it's been the past year that Fannie and Freddie and the regulator and partner like Walker and Dunlop and all of our competitor firms have been really diving into this issue with you all to to, to root it out and to figure out where it has been and uh, to try and uh, make sure that the the information sources and the policies and procedures that are around all that are robust enough to make sure that we're catching it. Um, I think the other interesting thing that you pointed out, Priscilla, is that the difference between the Fannie Mae Dust model and the Freddie Mac Optigo model in the sense that you've got the dust lenders out there doing the underwriting, taking the risk and holding the risk in the mortgage loan. Therefore, if we do have fraud, um, you know, it's we're the ones, if there's a loss on it, we're the ones taking in Walker Nellis 
position the first loss versus some of our competitor firms have Perry Pursue with with Fannie Mae. On the Freddie Mac side, where it's non-delegated, mm-hmm. it's there's a big question mark as, is it Walker Knopf's responsibility to catch the fraud? Is it Freddie Mac's responsibility to catch the fraud? Or is it the BP's buyer's responsibility to find the fraud and the tape when they're buying the first loss position? And should it go back to the BP's buyer? I think the Fannie Mae model is a much clearer, if you will, chain of responsibility from an underwriting standpoint versus the Freddie Mac model where we co-underwrite the loans with Freddie Mac. And it's sort of like, should you have caught it? Should we have caught it? Should the BP buyer be the one to pay for this? So it's very interesting as the regulators working with both you and Freddie Mac to figure out how to A, put in the policies and procedures to deal with this effectively going forward. And second of all, on those deals that do have fraud, which has been widely um, uh, reported upon, sort of who ends up paying for it? And it's a it's it's an important issue right now, as you as you correctly underscore. Yeah, look, I I can't comment on Freddie's model. I can comment about Fannie Mae's model, and you hit it on the spot. I mean, our model, the delegated model, exists because of the alignment of interest. Right, okay. we are in it together. Um, so it's it's the delegation. It's also the life of loan servicing. So when something does go wrong in our delegated model, we know exactly who to call. We go to the sponsor directly. So it is a very different model, but it is important for sponsors to have different sources of capital as well. But this broad issue, it really is an industry-wide issue. And we're working very closely with FHFA on it um, as well. But yeah, in the meantime, you know, we we the queues are longer. We acknowledge that. We don't like it. I'll be honest, we don't like it. We want to, you know, we want to delegate more and get back to a day where you have the certainty that you need so that you can deliver that for our sponsors. And and as you know, we we are all ears on that one. And we and obviously have a great partnership uh, behind that. Mm-hmm. Um, final question, Priscilla. You've been very generous to your time and, uh, and we thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Um, coming to Fannie Mae is mission-based for you. Yeah. You came because of the mission of Fannie Mae. You became because of your your dedication to housing and and providing safe, affordable housing to Americans. Um, What's mission accomplished from Priscilla's standpoint as it relates to improved safety and soundness, getting Fannie and Freddie out of conservative? You only have Fannie, but getting Fannie out of conservatorship and back as a as a as a, uh, a public company or something else that's outside of it that I don't know might be the mission that you have as it relates to your tenure as CEO. Well, one is the perception gap of Fannie Mae telling that story is number one. Number two is continuing to lean on our mission. I mean, we didn't even get to talk about what we're doing about increasing access to capital and the credit invisible and how we're using technology to see more people, to serve more people. Holy cow, we're just getting started with what we're doing with on time rent payments. Now we're doing cash flow underwriting. Now we're, we're saying, holy cow, there's about 30 million people in the gig economy. Are we looking at their cash flows? So my hope is that I could continue to help Fannie Mae to build on the work that's already started and you the technology to allow us to look at borrowers and renters in a safe and sound way to provide access to credit. Like those are my parents. Like, like I get so much inspiration from, you know, people who are not seen by the system and we could help do that. And technology is helping us. And then the third thing is, you know, I'm also an operator. I love running the operations and working with our cyber people, our operations people, our risk people. It's a really fun place to be. There's a lot of energy, 8,300. We're all like we come to work every day. Where everyone is a change maker at Fannie Mae, and um, that's just I just throw a lot of um, energy from all of that. Well, given Fannie's role in the housing finance system, as well as the partnership that we have, I'm very thankful that you're in the seat that you're in, and I'm also thankful that you joined me for this conversation. Um, thanks, Priscilla. It's great to see you, and uh, thanks for all you do. Thank you, thank you, and congratulations uh, again. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us.